The Busker by Paul Jennings. Can you lend me ten dollars, Dad? I asked. No, he answered, without even looking up. Oh, go on, just till pocket money day. I'll pay you back. He still didn't look at me, but started spreading butter onto a bread roll. He was acting just as if I wasn't there. He ate the whole roll without saying a word. It was really annoying, but I had to play it cool. If I made him mad, I'd never get the money. I'll do some jobs, I pleaded. I'll cut the whole lawn. That's worth ten dollars. This time he looked up. You must be crazy, he said. If you think I'll ever let you near that lawnmower again. Last time you cut the lawn, you went straight over 15 plants I'd just put in. They cost me $25 to buy and 5 hours to plant. You cut every one of them off at the base, and now you want me to give you $10? I knew straight away I had made a mistake by mentioning the lawn. I had to change the subject. But it's important, I told him. I need it to take Tanya to the movies on Saturday. That's important. Taking Tanya to the pictures is important. It is to me, I said. She's the biggest spunk in the whole school. And she's agreed to go with me on Saturday night if... Another mistake. I hadn't meant to tell him that bit. If what? He growled. If I take her in a taxi. If I can't afford a taxi, she's going to go with Brad Bellamy. He's got pots of money. He gets $15 a week from his dad. Good grief, lad. You're only 15 years old, and you want to take a girl out on a taxi. What's the world coming to? When I was your age... Oh, never mind, I said. Forget it. I walked out of the room before he could get started on telling me how he had to walk five miles to school when he was a boy, and bare feet in the middle of winter, and then walk home again and chop a ton of wood with a blunt axe. Every time I told the story, it got worse and worse. The first time he told it, he had to walk two miles to school. The way it was going... It would soon be 50 miles and 10 tons of wood chopped with a razor blade. I walked sadly out into the warm night air. Dad just didn't understand. This wasn't just any old date. This was a date with Tanya. She was the best looking girl I'd ever seen. She had long blonde hair, pearly teeth and a great figure. And she had class. Real class. There was no way that Tanya was going to walk to the movies or go on a bus. She'd already told me it was a taxi or nothing. I had to give her my answer tomorrow morning, or she'd go with Brad Bellamy. He could afford ten taxis, because his dad was rich. I'm going for a walk down the beach, I yelled over my shoulder. There was no answer. Might as well be dead for all dad kid. I walked along the beach in bare feet, dragging my toes through the water. I tried to think of some way of getting the money. I could buy a tax lotto ticket. You never knew what could happen. Someone had to win. Why not me? Or maybe I could find the mahogany ship. It was buried along the beach there somewhere, under the sand. And it hadn't been seen for over a hundred years. What if the sea had swept the sand away, and left it uncovered that very night, and I found it, and I could claim the reward of one thousand dollars? Boy, would I be popular then. I could hire a gold-plated taxi to take Tanya out. The beach was deserted, and the moon was out. I could see quite clearly. I walked on and on, well away from town and the houses. It was lonely and late that night, but I wasn't scared. I was too busy looking out for the mahogany ship and thinking of how I would spend the reward money. Every now and then I'd see something sticking out of the sand, and I'd run up to it as fast as I could. Each time I was disappointed. All I found were old 44-gallon drums and bits of driftwood that had been washed up by the heavy surf. It's funny, I didn't really expect to find the mahogany ship. Things like that just don't happen. But in the back of my mind, I kept thinking I might stumble over it and be lucky. After a while, I decided to climb to the top of the sand dunes that ran along the beach. I knew I could see for miles from up there. I struggled to see the top and sat down under a bent and twisted tree. Just at that moment, the moon went in and everything was covered in darkness. What are you looking for, boy? said a deep voice from the shadows. I must have jumped at least a metre off the sand. I was terrified. There I was, miles away from any help, on an isolated beach in the middle of the night, and an unseen man was talking to me from the depths of the shadows. I wanted to run, but my legs wouldn't move. What are you looking for, boy? The voice asked again. I stared into the darkness under the tree. I could just make out a shadowy figure sitting on the sand. I couldn't see his face, but I could tell from the voice that he was very old. I finally managed to say something. 
Uh, the mahogany ship, I answered. I'm looking for the mahogany ship. Who are you? He didn't answer me, but asked me another question. Why do you want to find the mahogany ship, boy? The reward, I stammered. There's a reward of a thousand dollars. And what would you want with a thousand dollars if you had it? The voice asked sadly. I don't know why I didn't turn and run. I was still scared. I felt a little better and I thought I could probably run faster than an old man if he tried anything. Also, there was something about him that made me want to stay. He sounded both sad and wise at the same time. Our oh, girl, I said. There's this girl called Tanya. I need money to take her out. Not a thousand dollars, only ten, but a thousand dollars would be good. The old man didn't say anything for a long time. Still couldn't see him properly, but I could hear him breathing. Finally, he sighed and said, You think that money will make this girl like you? You think that a thousand dollars will make you popular? He made it sound silly. I didn't know what to say. Sit down, boy, he commanded. Sit down and listen. I nearly ran off and left him. It was all really spooky and strange, but I decided to do what he said. He sounded as if he expected to be obeyed, so I sat down on the sand and peered into the darkness, trying to see who he was. I'm going to tell you a story, boy, and you're going to listen. When I'm finished, you can get up and go, but not until I've finished, understand? I nodded at the dark shadow and sat there without moving. This is what he told me. Many years ago, there was a busker who worked in Melbourne. He stood by the railway station and played music to the people who went by. He dressed completely in flags. His trousers, coat and vest were made from flags and his bowler hat was covered with a flag. When he pushed a button, a small door would open on his hat and flags would pop out. He played a number of different musical instruments. With his feet, he pushed pedals, which banged three drums. He had a mouth organ on a wire near his face and he played a guitar with his hands. His music was terrible. But people always stopped to watch and listen because of his small dog. The dog, whose name was Tiny, walked around with a hat in her mouth and took up the money that people threw. Tiny had a coat made out of the Australian flag. Whenever the hat was empty, Tiny would stand up on her hind legs and walk around like a person. Everyone would laugh and then throw money into the hat. The busker, for that is what everybody called him, was jealous of the dog. He could see that people really stopped to give money because of Tiny and not because of his music. But there was nothing he could do about it because he needed the money. As the months went by, the busker became more and more miserable. He wanted people to like him and not the dog. He started to treat Tiny badly when nobody was looking. Sometimes he would blame her if the takings were poor. Often he would forget to feed Tiny for days at a time. The little dog grew thinner and thinner until at last she was so weak that she couldn't hold the head up for the money. She had to drag it along the ground with her teeth. Finally, a man from the SPCA came to see the busker when he was working outside the station. That dog is a disgrace, he said. You're not looking after it properly, and so hungry its bones are sticking out. It's not to work again until it's healthy. I'll give you three weeks to fatten it up. If it isn't healthy, by then, I'll find. The crowd was standing around listening. Mm, yes, it's a shame, said a man who'd been watching. Look at that poor little thing. Other people started to call and boo at the busker. He went red in the face, and he packed up his drums and guitar and put them in his car and drove off with Tiny. It was a long way to the busker's house, for he lived well out of town. All the way home, he thought about what had happened. It's all the fault of the rotten dog, he said to himself. If it wasn't for her, none of this would have happened. The further he went, the more angry he became. When he reached home, he grabbed Tiny by the scruff of the neck, took her out into the backyard. In the middle of the yard was an empty well. There was no water in it at the bottom, but it was very deep. It was so deep you couldn't see the bottom. Fix you, Tiny, said the busker. You're not allowed to work for three weeks. Very really well then, you can have a holiday. A nice holiday. He went and fetched a bucket and tied a rope to it. Then he put Tiny on the bucket and lowered her into the well. The poor little dog whimpered and barked, but as soon as she was so far down, she could hardly be heard. When the bucket reached the bottom, Tiny jumped out of the bucket and sniffed around the bottom of the well. It was damp from the water that trickled down the wall, but there was nothing to eat. The busker pulled up the bucket and went inside. Tiny looked up, but all she could see was a small circle of light far above. She walked round and round at the bottom of the well, always gazing up at the patch of light at the top. 
The next day, the busker went out to work without Tiny. He had no dog to carry the hat around, so he just put it on the ground for people to put their money in. But hardly anyone did. The busker tried his best. He played every tune he could think of, and he cracked jokes. But it was no good. In one day, he only took in 50 cents. Now he knew for sure it was Tiny that the people liked, and not him. He went home, and threw some meat down the well. He could hear the faint sound of Tiny barking far below. No good, Tiny, shouted the busker. I'm not letting you out for three weeks. That'll teach you a lesson. Every day the busker went to work and the same thing happened. He played his music, but hardly anyone put money in the hat. No one likes me or my music without Tiny, said the busker to himself. He was angry. He wanted people to like him. It wasn't the money so much. He just wanted people to like him. Each night when he reached home, the busker threw meat down the well for poor Tiny. Hurry up and get fat, Tiny, he said. Because you're not coming out till you do. Tiny walked round and round at the bottom of the well. All day and night she looked up, hoping to be taken out. But no one ever came except the busker, and all he did was throw down meat once a day. Three weeks went very slowly for the busker. Each day he stood at the station playing his music to the people who walked by without listening. But the three weeks went by much, much more slowly for the little dog, who lay at the bottom of the well, always looking up at the sky for the help that didn't come. At last, the three weeks was up. The busker decided to get Tiny out. He lowered the bucket down into the well, but the little dog didn't know what to do. She walked around the bucket, but didn't get into it. The busker hadn't counted on this. Get in, you stupid dog, he shouted, but it was so far down that Tiny could hardly hear him. In the end, he had to go and have a rope ladder made. It cost him a lot of money, because it was so long, and it took a long time to make. Tiny was down the well for another week before it was finished. Then something happened that changed everything. The busker won Tat's Lotto. A letter came telling him that he'd won over a million dollars. He couldn't believe his luck. It was wonderful. First thing he did was to take his drums, his flags and guitar, and throw them down the tip. He went and bought himself a new car and a stereo. Every day he went to the shops and bought himself anything he wanted. Soon the house filled with every luxury you could think of. All this time Tiny was still at the bottom of the well, barking and walking around and around looking up at the world that was so out of reach, so far above. Each night the busker came and threw down meat, and each night he told himself he would get Tiny out in the morning. But when the morning came, he forgot and did something else. The truth is, the busker was still unhappy. He had no more friends than before. When he bought things, the salesmen were nice to him. They patted him on the back and told him how wise he was to buy this or that, and as soon as he'd bought their goods, they lost interest and didn't want to talk to him anymore. In the end, he realized he only had one friend in the world. Tiny. Tiny was the only one who really liked him, and he had put her down a well. He felt bad about what he had done to his little friend, and rushed to the well to get her out. The busker climbed down the well to get Tiny. He was frightened because it was so deep, and he knew he had to go. There was a terrible smell in the well, which got worse, and the busker went deeper. When he reached the bottom, he put Tiny inside his jumper, and started to climb back up the rope. All the way up, Tiny licked the busker's face, even though he had put the poor little dog down the well for all that time. When he reached the top of the well, the busker put Tiny on the ground. What he saw made tears come into his eyes. Tiny's head was bent back and her eyes stared up at the sky. She couldn't straighten up her neck. It was so stiff that she could only walk around looking upwards. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, cried the busker. What have I done? Forgive me, Tiny, forgive me. Tiny licked the busker on the face. From that time on, Tiny always walked with her head bent back, staring at the sky. No vet and no doctor could do anything about it. She'd been down the well too long, and her neck was fixed in a bent back position for the rest of her life. The busker looked after Tiny well from that time on. He fed her the best food, and took her with him everywhere he went. Tiny trotted around after the busker, wagging her tail, even though her neck was bent and her head stared up at the sky. The busker had all the love of the little dog, even though he had treated her so badly. But it still wasn't enough. He wanted people to like him. What good am I? he said to Tiny. When my only friend is a dog. He became more and more miserable, until one day he hit upon a great idea. A great idea indeed. Well, so he thought. He put an advertisement in the paper which said, To give away, free money, one dollar per person, come and get it. Two Rose Street, Melton, every day at nine. Tiny, he said to the busker, the crowds will like me now. 
This time I'll give them money, instead of them giving it to me. I'll give away half of all I have. I don't need a million dollars. Half of that will do. Those who need money can come and get a dollar, each whenever they like. The next morning, the busker set up his tent in front of his yard, he put a table and a chair and a bucket full of one dollar coins. He hung a notice outside which said, free money, one dollar each. At nine o'clock, two scruffy looking boys came in. Where's the free money, pop? said one of them. This wasn't what the busker had expected. He didn't really want children, especially rude ones, but he had to keep his word. So he took a one dollar coin from the bucket under the table and gave it to the boy. The boy looked at it carefully and said to his friend, It's real! Then he turned around and ran out of the tent. The other boy held out his hand, snatched his coin and disappeared out of the tent before the busker changed his mind. Soon the tent was filled with more and more children. The word had spread quickly and every child in the neighbourhood was there. Form a line! yelled the busker. No pushing! The children were jostling and shoving and some were trying to push in. The busker was upset at the rudeness of the children. The first three simply grabbed the money and ran, but the fourth child, a girl with big brown eyes, said, Gee, thanks a lot, thanks heaps. She turned around to walk out of the tent, but the busker called her back. Here, he said, handing her another dollar. You're a very polite little girl, the only one who has said thanks. The next girl in line heard what was said. After the busker handed her one dollar, she said, Thanks a lot, mister, and then stood there without moving. What are you waiting for? asked the busker. My other dollar, said the girl. I said thanks too, so I should get two dollars as well. The busker sighed and handed her another dollar. After that, all of the children discovered their manners and said thanks. The busker had to give all of them two dollars. He smiled to himself. Well, at least they were grateful. The line grew longer and longer. Soon it reached all the way down the street. After about fifty children had taken their two dollars, an old woman came to the front of the queue. The busker handed her a dollar. She looked at it and said, Oh, thank you, love. You're a very kind man. Very kind indeed. The busker smiled and gave her five dollars. He was pleased that she liked him so much. As the morning passed, more and more adults joined the queue. The ones who were polite received more money. The busker gave fifty dollars to one young woman who said, What a wonderful, generous and good man you are. This is more like it, he thought to himself. People really like me. They can see him a really good man. He gave Tiny a pat on the head. He didn't even mind when the people in line paid attention to Tiny. He wasn't jealous of Tiny now that he had his own admirers. By lunchtime the bucket of money was empty. Busker put up another sign which said, Closed. Go on to the bank for more money. The busker took out two buckets of coins from the bank. You better give me some notes as well, he said to the teller. He took out ten thousand dollars worth of notes. When he reached home, he found the queue had grown to over a mile long. He went down the street and around the corner. As he went by, people waved and a cheer went up. Good old Mr. Busker, someone yelled out. Mr. Busker. No one had ever called him that before. He felt wonderful. He went into the tent and started handing out more money. Most people received two dollars, but the ones who were especially nice, or said especially nice things, got more. One old man came in knelt at the busker's feet, kissed his shoes. Oh, great one, he said. I give thanks to you for your great compassion and generosity. The busker was moved. There was no need for that, he said. And he gave the man two hundred dollars. The news soon spread along the line. The more good things you said about the busker, the more you got. A lot of people left the queue because they couldn't bring themselves to do it. But plenty more took their places. Soon everyone was getting at least twenty dollars. At five o'clock, the busker put up a notice saying he had closed for the night and would be back in the morning. He went inside and sat down. He was very tired and soon fell asleep in the chair. At midnight, he was woken up by a noise outside on the street. He went over to the window and looked out. Got a terrible shock. There were people still there in a long queue. They were sitting on the footpath in sleeping bags and blankets. Some had even put up small tents. A man in a van was selling pies, hot dogs and ice creams. No one wanted to lose their place in the queue, they were all staying for the night. It was like a crowd waiting to buy tickets to see a pop star. The busker grinned. He felt like a movie star. All of these people were there because of him. In the morning, the television crew came. They did interviews with the busker, and he was on the evening news. People came from everywhere to see the sight. People arrived to control the traffic and keep crowds in order. The queue grew longer and longer, and the busker gave out larger and larger amounts of money.
He had to. The people expected it when they said nice things to him. They went to lots of trouble. Some held up signs with his name on. Others had done drawings of him. One group had formed a band and sang a song saying what a great person the busker was. Two students had made up a poem. He gave them $200 each. On the third day, the queue was four miles long. On the fifth day, it was six miles long. People had to wait for three days to reach the front, and the busker had given away over half a million dollars. The money was brought every morning from the bank in an armoured car. Tiny ran up and down the line, licking everyone with her little turned up head. At the end of the week, the armoured car brought a large box of money. I will need $100,000 to see me over the weekend, said the busker. Sorry, said the bank manager, but there are only $90,000 left. If I were you, I would stop now and keep some for myself. Busker knew this was good advice, but he couldn't keep it. The crowd all expected money. Some of them had been waiting in line for three days and three nights. He tried to cut it back and give each person less, but he couldn't. They all knew what each compliment was worth. $200 for a good song about the busker, $50 for a drawing. He tried to give less, but they started complaining and yelling that it wasn't fair, that they were being cheated. The busker was sick of it. He realized that they didn't really like him. He was tired of hearing people tell him how good he was, but he had to keep going. Finally, the terrible moment came. He ran out of money. There wasn't one cent left. He wrote a sign which said, Out. Of. Money. He hung the sign on the tent door and ran into the house with Tiny. The news spread down the line like wildfire. There's no more money, they yelled. The line broke up and a mob charged up to the house. They started yelling and banging on the door. The busker was scared out of his mind. Someone threw a rock through the window and glass scattered all over the floor. Cheat! He heard someone yell. Robber! I've been waiting in the freezing cold for two nights. Get him! Teach him a lesson! Another rock smashed through the window. The door was rattling and shaking. Busker knew it would soon collapse. He ran out the back door, followed by Tiny. The yard was empty and there was nowhere to hide. He could hear the mob smashing and crashing around inside the house. He had to hurry. Then he saw the well with the rope ladder still hanging down inside. He ran over to it and climbed down, leaving Tiny at the top. He was only just in time. The angry crowd burst into the backyard, yelling and shouting. When they saw that he had escaped, they went crazy. They smashed up the house and stole all the busker's new purchases. They broke everything they could get their hands on. One group even destroyed the back fence and the top of the well. Someone untied the rope ladder and let it go. They had no idea that far below, the terrified busker was hiding at the bottom. After a while, the police managed to control the mob and send them home. But it was too late to save the house. When darkness came, it was a complete ruin. The busker looked up and saw the moon. He thought it would be safe to call out for help. He yelled and yelled at the top of his voice, but no one answered. Nobody could hear him, for the well was too deep, and no one knew he was there, except Tony. Days passed and no help came. It was cold and dark and smelly at the bottom of the well. The busker would have starved to death if it hadn't been for Tiny. The little dog ran off in search of food. It was very difficult, for with her head bent back, she had trouble picking up anything in her mouth. She had to lie down on her side, grasp a piece of food in her teeth, and then stand up. After this, she would trot to the well with an old bone or a piece of stale bread and drop it down. Days turned into weeks and still no help came. The busker stayed alive by eating whatever tiny drop down the well. Sometimes it was a piece of rotten meat from a dustbin, or a gnarled old bone left by another dog. Once, tiny dropped down a dead cat, or well, whatever it was, the busker had to eat it or starve. In all this time, tiny gained everything she found to the busker. She ate practically nothing for herself. After a month, she was skin and bone, and so weak she could hardly drag herself to the well. The busker shouted and shouted every day, but no one came. He yelled up at the sun, at the clouds and the moon so far above, but no one answered. Then one day a terrible thing happened. Nothing was dropped down the well. No bone, no scraps, nothing. The next day was the same, and the day after that. The busker licked the water off the wall, but he had nothing to eat. He knew that his time had come. He couldn't last much longer. He grew weaker and weaker, and he wondered what had happened to Tiny. At the end of the fifth week, the busker decided to give one more loud shout. His voice was almost gone. Help! He screamed. Help! He peered up at the small dot of light above. Was that a head looking down? Was that a voice? He strained to listen. Hang on! 
said a faint voice. Or soon have you out? He was saved. After a while, steel cable came down the well. There was a small seat at the end. The busker sat on it and yelled up at the well. Take me up! Take me up! When he reached the top, he blinked. The bright light hurt his eyes, but he managed to see four or five men with a tow truck and a winch. They were staring at his wild, smelly, dirty man that had come out of the well. We'd better get you to the hospital, said one of the men. You don't look good. You're lucky to be alive, said another. I never would have heard you if it wasn't for that poor little dog lying over there. Came over to see if it was still alive and heard you calling out. The busker ran over to where the little dog lay on the ground. She was dead. She'd starved to death because she had dropped every piece of food she could find down to the busker. Tears ran down his tangled beard and picked up Tiny in his arms. You can leave me, he said to the men. I'll be alright. He buried Tiny in a small grave there in the backyard. On a piece of wood he wrote, My friend Tiny, rest in peace. Then the busker shuffled off. He was never seen again. And that was the end of the story, said the old man. I'd forgotten where I was, sitting there on a sand dune at the beach in the middle of the night. The story had completely taken me in. I looked at the old man, but I couldn't see his face. I wanted to ask him questions. I wanted to know if the story was true. I wanted to know what had happened to the busker, but I never got the chance. Go now, boy, said the old man. That is the end of the story. Go, leave me alone. I'm tired. I didn't want to go, but he sounded as if he meant it. Stood up and walked away along the top of the sand dune. After I'd gone a little way, the moon came out. I turned around and looked back at the tree where the old man had told the story. I could see him clearly. He had a white beard and was standing there in the moonlight, looking up into the tree. Then he walked away, now looking up at the stars and the moon. With a shock, I realised his neck was fixed back. He couldn't move it. He was destined to spend all his days looking up, as he had looked up that well so many years ago. The story was true. The old man was the busker. I watched him shuffle away with his bent neck. Then the moon went in and he was gone. I ran home as fast as I could and jumped into bed. But I couldn't sleep. I lay there thinking about the sad, strange tale of Tiny and the busker, who had tried to use money to make people like him. Next morning, I met Dad on the stairs. He pushed ten dollars into my hand. There you are, Tony, he said. Tanya won't go with you unless you take her in a taxi. You might as well have the money. Oh, thanks, Dad, I said. Stuffed the ten dollars into my pocket. Then I went round to Tanya's house and I told her to go jump in a lake. <laughs>